Good morning and welcome to the exercise panel session with Dr. Mark Tonopolsky. He is the Clinical and Research Director of the Corkins and Lambert Family Neuromuscular and Neurometabolic Clinic at McMaster University. He holds an endowed chair at McMaster Children's Hospital and Hamilton Health Sciences Foundation in Neuro Neuromuscular Diseases and is a professor of pediatrics and medicine. His research focuses on nutritional exercise and pharmacological therapies for primarily mitochondrial neurometabolic <clears throat> and neuromuscular disorders and aging. In addition, he studies the psychological, psychological molecular aspects of mitochondrial adaptation to exercise and the effects of aging on skeletal muscle and mitochondria. Thanks very much for the introduction. Can everyone hear me at the back? Yes? Good. Uh, I'll try and talk slowly because uh, I see there's closed captioning. This is very much uh, like being in Europe or South America where they are translating into a different language. And I've been known to talk quickly, so it'll be difficult for me to slow down so that they can keep up with my uh, talk. So what I'm going to be discussing today is uh, the benefits of exercise in primary mitochondrial disease. But of course, this has relevance for any uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. And the one that everyone in this room has is aging, which of course is a mitochondrial disorder, uh, which we all have. So in our laboratory, uh, mitochondria are a major focus of our research interest. Uh, clinically, that's the main thing uh, that we see in the uh, clinic. And we're very interested in looking at normal human physiology to try and better understand how we can develop therapy for people who have different disorders. So in the clinic, what we see are patients that have muscle atrophy, things like muscular dystrophy, Charcot-Marie tooth disease, and several types of mitochondrial disease, there is muscle atrophy. We also see a number of patients with mitochondrial dysfunction. Of course, that's why most of you are here. Patients with primary mitochondrial disease, that's one of the canonical features of the disorder, but we now know that even patients who have muscular dystrophy or Charcot-Marie tooth disease, when their mitochondria, or actually when their muscles aren't working properly, eventually the mitochondria become dysfunctional, so the two tend to blend together. And with aging, of course, we see both of these things. There's a disorder in aging called sarcopenia, which affects 30% of those over the age of 70, and this leads to impairments in their daily activities. These individuals also, when you do a muscle biopsy, have significant mitochondrial dysfunction. And as you'll see later in my talk, these two are linked entities. So in our laboratory, we also do a number of studies looking at weight training exercise, which increases strength and muscle mass, and endurance exercise, which increases endurance, of course, and the total amount of mitochondria and their efficiency. The advantage of studying healthy people during physiological adaptation is that we can do muscle biopsies, we can put uh, arteriovenous catheters in their legs, which most of the people in the room probably don't want six or seven muscle biopsies as part of a research study. And from there, we can develop physiologic and molecular concepts that we can apply to our patients who have either weakness or mitochondrial dysfunction or both, and try to develop new therapies to try and improve their quality of life. So when we think about the mitochondria, the first thing that everyone uh, learns in uh, high school uh, science class is that the mitochondria generate energy. But it's important to note that the mitochondria do many more things. They're involved in a whole host of cellular processes. And therefore, although we've done a lot of work in the area of nutritional supplementation, often it only targets one or two pathways. Whereas with exercise, if you make new and healthy mitochondria, you target all of the pathways of mitochondrial dysfunction. So when mitochondria don't work properly, there's a process called apoptosis, where the cells die, uh, and that's particularly important in the nervous system. That's one of the main ways that cells can die. And if mitochondria don't work properly, uh, they trigger this process called apoptosis. The other thing that's important to note is that if mitochondria don't work properly, we get something called telomere shortening. Telomeres are essentially an indicator of how many times a cell has undergone replication. So to some extent it's called a replicometer. And those of you who are over the age of 65, you have very much shorter telomeres than those of you who are younger. And these telomeres shorten over life. And once they hit a critical threshold, that cell can't divide. 
and that leads to cell death. The other thing that's now apparent is that if mitochondria don't work properly, they release a number of danger-associated molecular patterns. And Bob Navio was just talking about some lovely work that he's done in autism, showing how an abnormal danger-associated molecular pattern from mitochondrial dysfunction is important in autism. And he's developed some interesting strategies to try and mitigate this process. But anyone with significant mitochondrial dysfunction will have activation of inflammation. And then finally, in addition to generating ATP, if the mitochondria don't work properly, they can generate too many free radicals, uh, something called oxidative stress. And that's the uh, premise behind things like coenzyme Q10, uh, alpha lipoic acid, and other vitamins which are antioxidants to try and combat the excessive oxidative stress, which in turn can damage muscle. So one of the things that people were worried about with exercise is they said, Mark, why on earth would you exercise someone with mitochondrial dysfunction? Because we know exercise causes oxidative stress. You're going to make them worse. And we'll talk more about this later, but that's why you have to start off carefully and slowly. But the cell's response to pulses of oxidative stress results in adaptations which minimize the oxidative stress. So when we trained older adults who had high oxidative stress, their cells responded by increasing the antioxidants in their body and their total oxidative stress was lower after exercise. And the same is true in mitochondrial disease mice and almost certainly in patients. So this is a slide that I borrowed from my good friend and colleague Tanya Tavasalo, uh, who's done a lot of work on exercise and I'm going to be highlighting several of her studies today uh, with specific reference to mitochondrial patients. So if someone has mitochondrial dysfunction, Every cell in the body, with the exception of the red blood cells, have mitochondria. And anywhere in the pathway of exercise intolerance, there can be problems. So for example, if the diaphragm isn't working properly, uh, and the lungs were not extracting oxygen properly, you can have an impairment of loading oxygen into the blood. If the heart is not pumping properly, and it's not delivering blood to the peripheries, you can have exercise impairment. And certainly in pediatric mitochondrial disease, hypertrophic, dilated, and non-compaction cardiomyopathy are fairly common entities. And therefore, the heart can't pump the blood, and that can be a cause of exercise impairment. We do know from the adult cardiomyopathy literature that exercise actually improves heart function. So that might be a locus of where there's dysfunction, where we can do something about it with exercise. Of course, the delivery of oxygen through blood vessels to the muscle, that can be a site of impairment. And when we look at electron micrographs of our adult patients with mitochondrial disease, we see very significant damage to those capillaries. What's important is that those capillaries can proliferate and we can get new pathways to deliver oxygen to muscle in response to exercise. And of course, with exercise, as I'll show you, there's an imp improvement in the mitochondria themselves. The enzyme activity goes up and there can be improvements at that level. So anywhere along this axis, one can have exercise impairment, but fortunately with exercise training, we can partially reverse some, if not all of these. So many of our patients with mitochondrial disease have manifestations of their disorder in muscle. Some people have cramps, some people have muscle pain, usually in the context of exercise. If pushed too hard, some of our patients first present to the emergency department with what's called rhabdomyolysis, where their muscles actually break down and they release proteins into the blood, which end up in the urine and can damage the kidneys, and that's called myoglobinuria due to rhabdomyolysis. A number of our patients, about 50%, for example, of our MELAS patients, and 70% of our patients with chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia who are female, have significant muscle weakness. And that becomes an issue, of course, because it's hard to get out of a chair, hard to get off of the toilet, and there's functional impairments in daily activities which can impact uh, one's life. Another prominent thing that we see, even in those without weakness, they can have exercise intolerance. So getting out of a chair is fine, climbing one or two stairs is fine, but going up two or three flights of stairs or going for a 10 or 15 minute walk to the uh, store becomes an issue and the exercise intolerance is their predominant manifestation. So we've actually had patients with mitochondrial disorders, Milas syndrome is one of our examples, where their leg strength was 100% normal on very sensitive measuring devices, 
but they couldn't spin a bike for more than 43 seconds with zero load and they pretty much fell off the bike. So there can be a dissociation between the two, uh, weakness and exercise intolerance, but often they go together. An important thing to remember is that within activity we get both exercise intolerance and we get skeletal muscle weakness. So it becomes a vicious cycle that if you feel that you are having problems with activity and you're weak and you do less and less activity, it starts to become a, a self-perpetuating cycle. So this is just a schematic of the respiratory chain. And essentially the respiratory chain in the mitochondria is taking the food that you all had probably for your snack, the oxygen that you're breathing, and it's mixing together in this very elegant uh, organelle called the mitochondria to make ATP. Normally with exercise, as our muscles start to contract, ATP levels go up and they fuel muscle contraction. However, if you have primary mitochondrial disease and you can't efficiently, ext uh, efficiently extract oxygen, then you will end up with a decrease in ATP, less will come out into the cell, and there'll be less available for skeletal muscle contraction. As a consequence, people can have exercise intolerance. So how do we measure the function of the mitochondria? Any of you who have mitochondrial disease probably had a muscle biopsy taken at one point in your life, and they looked at the efficiency of the mitochondria using um, a technique called respirometry, where they measured the enzyme activity of the various complexes, and many people were initially defined as having complex one deficiency or complex four deficiency. As we know now, with increased availability of genetics, we now are finding the true genetic cause of those deficiencies. And that's measured through a spectrometer, and that was the common way that we used to do uh, a mitochondrial diagnosis. More recently, there are higher throughput methods with much smaller pieces of muscle that we can use. Uh, there's a high resolution respirometer called the Ouroboros, and we were just talking about that next door in uh, a recent discussion, where one can take very small amounts of cells, and in some cases, one milligram of muscle, and can get the same information as we used to get from almost a gram of muscle in this scenario. And so that's helping us to accelerate diagnosis, but really what these things are measuring is what's going on in our body. We are taking in food, we're taking in oxygen, we're mixing it, and we are extracting energy. And the way that we do this in a human, our human respirometer is something called VO2 max, or maximal oxygen consumption. So with this, when we put somebody on a bike and we hook them up to a machine that can measure the oxygen coming in and the oxygen that's going out, the difference between these two is how much their body can extract. So if you have an impairment in delivery of oxygen or an impairment in extraction, the latter being more common in mitochondrial disease, your oxygen consumption goes down, and if it gets too low, it's going to impair your daily activities. So just to summarize, our VO2 peak or VO2 max is a function of the ability to deliver blood to the working muscles and the ability to extract it. So QC is cardiac output, which is a function of the heart rate and the stroke volume. And this is why when people are exercising with mitochondrial disease and they have an impairment at the muscle's ability to extract oxygen, that's why the heart rate goes up so quickly. That's why people become so short of breath because the cell says, I gotta do something to get some oxygen here and if I can't extract it very efficiently because my mitochondria aren't extracting the energy, I increase my heart rate and that's why people feel this shortness of breath, they have exercise intolerance. But again, as you'll see, these factors can improve with exercise training, decreasing the symptoms that people have at the same absolute exercise intensity. Now it's been estimated that for independent living for older adults, they need a VO2 max of 12 milliliters per kilogram per minute. To put that into context, the average human being, sedentary North American, has a VO2 max of about 30 mils per kilogram per minute. We did a study several years ago in our patients with Milas syndrome, and the average VO2 was 9.2 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Now somehow these people were compensating and they were functioning in daily activities and functioning in society, but they were below the lower threshold estimated by the NIH for independent living. So clearly, VO2 max 
is impaired in many of our patients with mitochondrial disease, and it has a huge impact on their life and their function. So everything that we're trying to do is to improve their oxygen consumption. As we sit here, even if you're falling asleep in my talk, your VO2 max is around about three to four mils per kilogram per minute. So if your VO2 max is nine, that means getting up and walking to the toilet is the same as me going on a treadmill, ramping it up as hard as I can for an hour and uh, pretty much falling off the back end of the treadmill. And that's, uh, to put it into perspective, the kind of intolerance that people have. So what happens normally is that when we put someone on a treadmill and we increase the exercise intensity, if someone has a normal cardiovascular response, their VO2 goes up. With many patients with mitochondrial disease, their VO2 max will not go up very much because they can't extract oxygen. But as I pointed out, their cardiac output goes through the roof. And from a diagnostic perspective, this sort of a pattern on an exercise test twigs us into the possibility that this person might have mitochondrial disease because normally the heart rate and the stroke volume go up proportionate to the exercise intensity. Hmm, don't know why it's going on its own. Um, but in mitochondrial disease, they're separate. And the main impairment that we find is that it's at the level of the mitochondria in the muscle. So delivery is usually pretty good unless there's cardiomyopathy, but the muscle cannot extract the oxygen that's delivered to it. So if we look at the oxygenation of muscle in an individual without mitochondrial disease, so this is a control individual, when they exercise, they deoxygenate the blood in their arm. So the mitochondria take that oxygen and they use it for energy. And then when they stop exercising, it goes back to normal. Someone with mitochondrial disease, when they start exercising, they can't extract the oxygen because the mitochondria aren't working and we get a flat line. So we can actually use this exercise test to help diagnose mitochondrial disease in the clinic. And this can be done without this fancy machine called a spectrometer by just taking a blood sample and looking at the oxygenation, uh, which we frequently do in the clinic. But it also is a marker of an intervention. So before and after a drug trial, before and after exercise therapy, what we would see, especially if the drug's effective, of course, is an improvement in the ability to extract oxygen. And that definitely occurs with exercise training. So let's take a look at mitochondrial dysfunction and what the consequences are. So if one has, let's say, an impairment at complex three, if you had, for example, a cytochrome B mutation, what would that do to the cell? Well, the first thing that happens, of course, is that the energy that's coming in from our food at complex one and complex two is not being effectively transferred down to complex four, where oxygen is mixed with the, what are called reducing equivalents from food, to ultimately pump these protons here to make energy. So what happens is energy will go down. So if the cell loses the ability to make energy, it looks for other sources. And one of those sources is to use glycolysis, where you break down sugar. The downside of that is it produces lactic acid which in turn can inhibit the cell's function. But that's also a biomarker we use to look for mitochondrial disease, the increase in lactic acid in the blood. But this is the reason for it. Mutation here decreases this, which increases the need for alternative energy. There's one other alternative energy pathway that can be utilized from a therapeutic perspective, and that is the anaerobic system called phosphocreatine breakdown. So in our nerves, in our brain, in our muscles, we have high concentrations of something called phosphocreatine. When we exercise, or if we think too much, the phosphocreatine is immediately broken down for energy until the mitochondria can kick in. That lasts for about 10 seconds of physical activity. So the problem is, is that that energy gets used up very rapidly if the mitochondria don't do their job and kick in. So knowing this, several years ago, we did some clinical trials trying to supplement or increase phosphocreatine in our patients with creatine supplementation. And as you'll see in a minute, it forms part of our mitochondrial cocktail, but the rationale behind it has very good scientific underpinnings. Now, what other things happen? If we do not have effective flow of electrons through this elaborate system, we pump out what are called reactive oxygen species or free radicals. Now, all of us 
in normal life produce free radicals. That's part of normal physiology. And so when we exercise, these things are good. They actually stimulate an increase in new mitochondria. But if they're present in too high a level, they can damage fat, protein, DNA, and further damage the mitochondria. As a consequence, people have been using antioxidants for over 30 years in mitochondrial disease to try and mop up these free radicals. And I'll show you some examples of uh, these in just one minute. Now, the antioxidants that we use as a therapy uh, come from outside, so we call those exogenous antioxidants. But the cell's not stupid. If it has uh, free radicals floating around, or if we do exercise, we try to increase antioxidant enzymes within our body, and that's called uh, endogenous antioxidant upregulation. And that's what exercise does. It increases our normal body's capacity to deal with these free radicals. <clears throat> and that's one of the things that we see. So what are the strategies that people have used to treat mitochondrial disease? Well, one of them is to try and bypass the defect. So for example, if one had a defect at complex one, you could try and provide more energy to complex two. And we just heard a very nice talk minutes ago um, by a group in Sweden that's developing succinate compounds uh, which can bypass um, complex one because they feed into complex two. Everyone's heard of coenzyme Q10, and coenzyme Q10 is the electron acceptor from complex one and complex two. So it's thought to provide some bypass if you had a defect, for example, in complex one or complex two. And that's one of the main strategies people have looked at. Folks have tried to lower lactate, because now you know where that lactate comes from, so if we can bring it down, could it be helpful? Well, unfortunately, the drug that was developed called dichloroacetate caused significant nerve damage, and we only now use that in an acute emergency situation, because long-term use uh, proved, unfortunately, to be toxic in patients. I mentioned the free radicals, so a way to combat them are antioxidants. And depending on the uh, type of CoQ10 you use and other factors, CoQ10 is one, but of course vitamin E and something called alpha-lipoic acid is particularly potent. Alpha-lipoic acid is an endogenous component of mitochondria and it functions as an antioxidant. We've also mentioned alternative energy pathways. The cell immediately looks for other energy. That's why you get high lactate, because you're trying to burn through uh, sugar in the cytosol, but the downside is, unfortunately, that lactic acid uh, limits what you can get. So we've tried to provide creatine monohydrate to patients, and it certainly improved their high-intensity exercise capacity, uh, but it was a small study, so in that short period of time, we did not see an improvement in VO2 max, uh, but of course it improved uh, peak muscle performance. And I'm gonna spend the rest of my time today talking about exercise training, which really works at all of these levels to take advantage of normal physiology to try and combat dysfunctional mitochondria. And I'll just mention a few other specific things very briefly. In Milas syndrome in particular, there is a spasm of the blood vessels in the brain which leads to the stroke-like episodes. And there's been some very nice work first coming out of Japan uh, and some nice work by Dr. Scaglia showing that L-arginine and citrulline uh, can be helpful in those patients. And we certainly have this as standard of care in our MILAS patients when they come in with an acute stroke-like episode, and we usually keep them on a low-dose supplement. And Ingrid Tain, who's a friend and colleague of mine in Toronto, uh, received a UMDF grant uh, to actually study this further, and we've now been uh, uh, putting out guidelines as to how to use this uh, appropriately. And of course, there can be deficiencies, uh, folate deficiency has been well described, especially in pediatric mitochondrial disease, um, and especially in the cerebral spinal fluid, that's been found to be deficient in a number of patients. But I'll just briefly mention other important deficiencies that we've seen in our patients. 13% of our mitochondrial disease patients have vitamin B12 deficiency. So when a patient with vitamin B12 deficiency comes in, their symptoms are peripheral neuropathy, ataxia, dementia, fatigue. Does that sound like mitochondrial symptoms to you? Yeah. So if you've got mitochondrial dysfunction, it's low-hanging fruit to not miss a treatable underlying vitamin deficiency whose consequences on their own in an able-bodied person can be devastating. The second vitamin I'll just highlight is vitamin D. Um, 
Some people feel it's not so much of an issue if you're down south and you have lots of sun, but certainly in Canada, in our clinic, 13% of our patients have severe vitamin D deficiency in the rickets range, so low that these individuals have muscle weakness. I've actually seen patients, well, they're not patients, they're healthy neurosurgery residents, two in particular stand out, who came to see me and they thought they had mitochondrial disease. And I examined them and they had no history of exercise intolerance, none of the canonical features of mitochondrial disease. And I said, dude, I think, you know, I said to both guys, so dudes, um, you, I think you have a deficiency. So we looked for testosterone and we looked for B12 and iron stores. And what we found is that they had non-detectable vitamin D. So they were both, interestingly, neurosurgery residents. They had dark skin because they came from the Middle East. They were in neurosurgery, so they didn't see the light of day for two or three years. And they were severely vitamin uh, D deficient. Now, why that's important is that they were fatigued. They had weakness. They had problems even going up one flight of stair. And their muscle enzyme called CK was 600, the normal being 200. So I put them on therapy, and they said, you're full of crap. I've got mitochondrial disease. I know it. I'm on a biopsy, and I want my DNA sequenced. I said, just shut up and take your vitamin D. Two weeks later, sheepishly, I got an email within the day of each other from both of them saying, oh my goodness, I feel better. I can go up and downstairs. And I got my doctor to check my CK. It's totally normal. So again, I'm just bringing this up because we see it so frequently. And many neurologists, geneticists, you know, uh, and I'm part of that group, uh, we think of all the fancy new cool potential therapies, but you forget about the low hanging fruit. Simple stuff that can cause profound impairments in your patients, which are totally treatable. So don't miss that in the future. So I'll just briefly show one of our um, uh, studies. Uh, this was the first randomized double blind crossover study in mitochondrial disease that was published back in 2007. And what we did is we took the approach um, that people did with cancer. So with cancer, we knew that if you use one drug, the efficacy was not that great. And if you look at leukemia treatment, we now have almost a 95% cure rate in young children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia by adding multiple drugs. So we have a cocktail approach because cancer doesn't work in just one pathway. There's multiple final common pathways. And I just showed you that there's many consequences from mitochondrial dysfunction. So we designed this study to try and combat not just one thing like putting an antioxidant in or succinate to bypass, but to try and uh, cover off many of the bases. So we did a two month uh, trial where patients took either a placebo or the drug, two month washout and two month on the reciprocal uh, therapy. And we gave them uh, CoQ10, which was kindly provided by Tishcon because this was water soluble. And I'll show you, we showed that it was well absorbed. Uh, this was complex with vitamin E and the reason for that is that these two make a nice redox couple because if you give just one antioxidant, it can actually become a pro-oxidant. That was the rationale there. We gave them creatine monohydrate uh, and the rationale I just went through and we already did a preliminary study showing that it improved muscle strength in patients with uh, Mila syndrome. And then we used this mitochondrial specific antioxidant called uh, alpha lipoic acid. In this study, we had half of the patients with Mila syndrome and half had chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. The first and most important thing we showed is that the CoQ10 formulation actually got into their system. That's important because the powder formulations in, uh, in the gelatin capsules, uh, which is what our government was initially approving, uh, does not get absorbed at all. So we showed in this study that in fact, uh, the hydrosoluble form does get absorbed by humans and their uh, levels go up, the first requisite for a drug to work. We showed that this marker of oxidative stress uh, went down. This is a marker that shows DNA damage. We also showed that lactic acid was lower, and this was particularly prominent in the MILAS patients who had high lactates, whereas as most of you know, CPO patients rarely have high lactates. Uh, but across all comers, there was a, a significant drop. And another marker of oxidative damage to the lipid also went down. So again, this was a self-funded study. I sound like Bob Navio using my own research money, uh, my own uh, personal money uh, to fund research. Um, and so therefore, this obviously wasn't a long-term study to look at uh, clinical outcomes, but certainly all of the biomarkers of mitochondrial disease got better. And based on this alone, 
the Ontario government approved this cocktail uh, for our patients in Ontario through the Inherited Metabolic Disease Program. And so that uh, continues to be provided to patients uh, to this day, both children and adults. So now we'll just finish with uh, exercise um, work. So there's two main types of exercise, and again, there's all sorts, there's everything in between, but really we generally think of either weight training or resistance exercise leading to muscle hypertrophy, and that's a little bit fake because that's actually a patient with uh, myotonia congenita, but we do have people who get big muscles like this when they lift weights. But generally, at the muscle level, we don't see an increase in mitochondria in an able-bodied person. In contrast, if we take a young, healthy university student who's sedentary and we put them on a bike at lower intensity and we go for 20 or 30 minutes for four or five months later, we see that they're still skinny, but they get an increase in mitochondria. So packed inside their muscle, there's tons of mitochondria that now form. And so that's obviously advantageous if someone who had mitochondrial dysfunction could make more mitochondria if they were in fact functional. So the first thing we're going to look at is weight training. Uh, what's the theory? Why should this work in mitochondrial disease? And does it actually work? So the way to first understand this is based on a lovely work that was done um, by uh, several groups. Uh, one was Eric Shoebridge uh, in Montreal, and the second uh, was uh, work that was done uh, in uh, Newcastle uh, by Doug Turnbull's group. And what they found is they took advantage of a stem cell in muscle called a satellite cell. And I'll just give you a little bit of biology here. So the satellite cells are a stem cell for muscle. They hang out outside of the main muscle and they sit there in case there's a trigger for them to come into the muscle. So if I am able to take out a muscle biopsy and I put it in a petri dish, all of the main muscle will die but these little guys will start to proliferate and they'll try to repair the muscle. Those are called myoblasts. Now, as kids, we have tons of these uh, things floating around. In fact, 20% of all the uh, little cells that you see here are satellite cells. But even in adults, uh, about three to 4% of all of the nucleus uh, that's here in the muscle are these satellite cells. So with exercise or trauma, we can activate these things. And that's important to remember when I talk about uh, the therapy. So I was fortunate when Doug Turnbull came to Hospital for Sick Children a few years ago and uh, presented the work that they had discovered uh, serendipitously in a patient to take advantage of this process. So uh, I'll walk you through it. So what they found is that if they do a muscle biopsy on a patient with CPEO or Kern-Sayer syndrome, what you'll see is what are called Cox negative fibers. That means complex four is super low in the muscle. And if you actually cut this out with a special technique called laser capture microdissection, you'll see that there's massive mitochondrial DNA deletions in that fiber. And if you cut this healthy one out, there'll be very few deletions. But if you take the whole muscle and munch it up, there'll be deletions, and that's part of our diagnostic repertoire. But what they were interested in is they said, well, you know, we do a muscle biopsy on someone. If we want to do research on it, you go back to the freezer, you hack off a piece, you hack off a piece, and then there's nothing left. Maybe let's take this muscle, let's grow it in a petri dish, freeze down a whole bunch of myoblasts, and we can always bring them up for drug discovery. But what was interesting is that when they did this, and they took the muscle, put it into a tube and culture media, and then grew it on a plate, what they found is that all of the cells that were growing here in the petri dish were the healthy cells and none of these were growing. So what happens then is that they knew the only cells that were growing in a petri dish were satellite cells. So they were super smart and they said, okay, if satellite cells don't have the disease and they're hanging around outside, maybe if we bring these guys in, we can shift down the bad mitochondria. And that's the concept of mitochondrial DNA shifting. So it all came from a fluke, uh, both Eric and Doug Turnbull's group discovered this when they were trying to freeze down myoblasts in patients. So here you get tons of Cox negative fibers and in Petri dish all of them were Cox positive which suggested that if they could damage the muscle maybe they could get these guys activated and would that result in improvement. So what they did is they did a muscle biopsy and they put little markers where they knew where the biopsy was and they caused all sorts of local damage to the muscle 
and they let it heal for several months and uh, well for three weeks in this case um, uh, in this study and they went back and they re-biopsied and what they found is that a lot of those Cox negative fibers became Cox positive so what it showed is that if you inject a bad chemical to cause some damage to the muscle all the mature muscle dies but all these stem cells come in and they repair it with nice fresh new mitochondria so when I heard this my wife was fortunately there and she was doing some work with exercise um, and showing that there's damage and repair of muscle and she said well why do you stick you know fancy chemicals in why don't you just exercise them so uh, both uh, Doug's group with Tanya Tapasalo who was then working in Dallas uh, as well as Eric's group started doing some exercise studies on these patients. And what they showed uh, eventually after they showed the proof of concept is they did a clinical study with eight patients. And you can see here is one of the patients uh, doing exercise. And these patients all had CPEO or chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia where there are mitochondrial DNA deletions in Cox negative fibers. So what they did is they put them on a weight training program with what's called leg extension and flexion. So this is knee extension, and then you flip it around, you do uh, knee flexion, and then leg press, which you've probably seen people sitting down and pushing out against a weight. And it was very similar to what we do in young people and old people. They did 12 weeks of training, three times per week, at about 80% of their maximal capacity. So they did what are called six sets of six to eight reps. And we can talk about this uh, a little bit later, but in mitochondrial patients, doing fewer reps is sometimes important because if you do too many, then you can start tapping into the mitochondrial dysfunction and they tend to get more fatigued. So we like to do shorter uh, numbers of reps and longer time in between to allow the muscles to recover. And what they showed is that in the patients with CPEO, there is an increase in their leg uh, strength in uh, two of their uh, outcomes. Importantly, they show that the muscle enzyme called CK did not go up, which indirectly suggests that this was safe and they weren't causing permanent long-term damage. When they looked at the muscle, uh, there was evidence that the muscle was turning over and new fresh mitochondria were coming in. So central nuclei were up, the fibers were turning over and regenerating. There was an increase in these stem cells called satellite cells. But importantly, the amount of mitochondrial DNA deletions which is the hallmarker of the disease, got better. So they showed that not only functionally were they better, but genetically their muscles looked better. And I'll finish my last part uh, with endurance exercise, which causes mitochondrial proliferation. And if those are good mitochondria, it should dilute down the bad mitochondria and it should be good for the individual. So why is endurance uh, in exercise important? As I mentioned, low VO2 max is one of the hallmarks in many of our patients. You saw in our MILAS study, uh, it was under 10 mils per kilogram per minute. So that is really an important thing that we want to reverse because that affects your daily activities. We also know too that people that are deconditioned, people who are sitting in a wheelchair for more than a month, their VO2 max is going to drop by 30, 40%. So somebody that has mitochondrial dysfunction and isn't moving, it becomes a vicious cycle and they get incredibly deconditioned and low VO2 max. We did a study several years ago to show the importance of inactivity and we had healthy university students where we put a leg immobilizing brace on. So if you've ever hurt your knee and you had a brace on for two weeks, this is what happened to it. Two weeks of this leg immobilization brace and we had a 30% drop in mitochondrial function. So think about people who break their leg and are in a brace uh, or a cast for six or 12 weeks. If we had this much drop in two weeks in young, healthy, completely uh, fine individuals, you can imagine what other people must go through when they have a, a, a fall or a break, especially when they're older. So I won't go through all of the other stuff, but at the mRNA level, at the protein level, across the board, the mitochondria is shut down after just uh, two weeks of immobilization. Now we know and I'll show you the examples from the uh, studies that exercise can improve mitochondrial function in able-bodied people, both young, old, and you'll see in just a minute in mitochondrial disease um, patients as well. So what are the other benefits of physical activity? Well, if you don't move very much and you keep eating the same amount, people can become obese. And certainly in North America, even with able-bodied people, the prevalence of uh, various stages of obesity is shifting massively in this direction. 
And what this shows is that people who are very obese have a reduction in their lifespan by up to five years compared to someone who's normal weight. And one of the advantages of endurance exercise, it can help you to burn those calories so you don't put on the extra weight and keep one more in the, uh, you know, even overweight is better than being obese and certainly hopefully moving towards normal weight. But what's important here is even controlling for weight, whether you're really obese, overweight, or normal weight, physical activity is important. So these bars here are the completely inactive individuals, and these bars are people who are meeting the North American guidelines for recreational physical activity. So if you're inactive, even if you're normal weight, you have a five-year loss of your net lifespan. Um, so it's a pretty significant effect of physical activity, probably even more important than obesity. But of course, there's a whole host of other things that people have shown with endurance activity uh, that are potentially helpful. As I mentioned before, improvements in capillarization, and uh, although we haven't published it yet, it's dramatic, the capillary damage that we see in our mitochondrial disease uh, patients. Uh, improvement in bone health, uh, improvement in gut health, uh, reduction in uh, adipose tissue, which then improves diabetes, improvement at all of those levels of cardiac uh, delivery uh, to the muscle. So what's the evidence for this in real patients? That's all great, it's all theory and stuff, but does this actually work in patients with real mitochondrial disease? So there were two publications that came out simultaneously in the same issue of brain, uh, one by European group and the other by Tanya's group. So in this case, they had 20 mitochondrial uh, patients, 14 had point mutations in mitochondrial DNA, the other ones had deletions, 16 were healthy age-matched and sex-matched controls. So they did standard endurance exercise for 12 weeks at 70% of their VO2 max. So they tested them at the beginning, put them at an intensity that elicited 70%, and then as they got better, they ramped it up a little bit because that's one of the key features is you gotta start at whatever level you're at, and some people could be down here, other people could start here, but the important thing is to gradually increase the intensity, which is what they did. And what they found is that uh, citrate synthase, which is a marker of total mitochondria, went up uh, almost 100%. VO2 max went up, uh, again, by 67%. And it was identical to the controls. So the key point there is that mitochondrial disease patients respond similarly to these uh, uh, in types of intervention. And that's important because um, if you have a very low VO2 max, or a high VO2 max, you're responding very similarly and moving to a higher level. And importantly, again, they showed no evidence of muscle damage. So they did muscle biopsies to look for damage, and they used CK, and there didn't appear to be any damage. And then, as I mentioned, <clears throat> Tanya put out this paper in the same issue of brain, and they did a very similar study, this time in patients with single deletions. And same thing, they did 14 weeks of training, but they also showed what happens if you don't use it, do you lose it? And that is in fact the case. So what they found is that their work rate went up. So at the same level, they found it much easier and they could work harder. Their oxygen extraction improved in the muscle. And I showed you those measurements with the um, spectroscopy. But importantly, and this has been now seen in several studies, the quality of life went up. Because everyone in this room, at the end of the day, what you worry about is how good is my life? Is my life, do I perceive it as being really good or do I perceive my life as being really crappy and full of disability? And these are some of the measurements called the SF36 and they improved. And I did a, a review of all of the studies uh, published in mitochondrial disease and the majority show an improvement in quality of life. So all of these fancy measurements that we're doing, yeah, so what if it doesn't change your quality of life? But in fact, it appears to do that. Now, it's also important to note that the mitochondrial DNA point mutations didn't change because there were some people at the time who thought maybe if you do endurance exercise and you make new mitochondria, you're just going to make a whole bunch of crappy mitochondria and you're no further off uh, ahead. Uh, but they didn't actually see that. And there was some theoretical thought that maybe the bad mitochondria would get a selective advantage, which to me doesn't make sense. And of course, that did not happen. So that's good. But the final point is, if you don't use it, you lose it. So after 14 weeks, psh, they're right back to square one. So although it's great to exercise, you've got to keep doing it. So I'm just going to show you some of the work that we're doing in the lab, trying to find other 
uh, things that we can uh, use from a therapeutic perspective. And uh, some of this work started uh, based on our interest in aging. So there is a mouse model of mitochondrial disease uh, called the polymerase gamma mutator mouse. And polymerase gamma is a gene that is in fact one of the most common nuclear genes that causes pediatric and adult mitochondrial disease. What this does is it makes new copies of mitochondrial DNA. So every time you exercise, every time your cell dies, uh, your cell's under stress and it's trying to make new copies, it has to use polymerase gamma to make new mitochondrial copies. But this mouse was created to have a single mutation here that eliminated its ability to make repairs to the mitochondria. So it could make new ones, but if there was a mistake, it couldn't fix it. So these guys accumulate all sorts of mitochondrial point mutations in their DNA. And does that lead to damage? Well, this is what they look like. So these mice are the same age. This one has this one single letter change in the DNA in pole G, and it causes cataracts. Do patients with mitochondrial disease get cataracts prematurely? Yes. It causes decreased hearing, another canonical feature of mitochondrial disease. It causes mitochondrial dysfunction in muscle. It causes muscle atrophy and weakness. It causes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Almost everything that we see in our patients are seen in this mouse model of mitochondrial disease. So when I contacted Tom Prola to get my hands on these mice, because he created them and they weren't commercially available, he asked me what I wanted to do with them. And uh, I said, well, I'm gonna exercise them. And he was laughing. He said, are you kidding? What a load of crap. We've tried all these big pharma companies. They've tried all of their exercise in a pill and nothing helps the mice as if exercise is gonna do anything. So we persisted and he was kind enough to send me the mice. So what we did is we started them running on a treadmill. Uh, unfortunately, this works on my computer. This guy's supposed to be running back and forth on the treadmill uh, at three months of age to eight months of age. So they ran from an approximate human equivalent of 20 years of age to about age 65 uh, on the treadmill. And they did this three times a week um, with a one exercise day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and a day off in between for about 45 minutes at 70% of their peak. And then unfortunately we had to sacrifice them at the end of the study to see if it worked. And the other group was sedentary. So this is what they look like at the end of the experiment. These guys didn't exercise. Oh, sorry, these guys did exercise, and these guys did not exercise. So uh, unfortunately, again, my video is not working on this computer, but these guys usually, you can see them running around like crazy, having a good time, and these guys barely move um, because they have severe mitochondrial disease. So right there, you can see that there's a significant benefit. But if we look at things like uh, mitochondrial function, it was dramatically rescued and organs such as the brain, which shrinks in these animals, was rescued. They get hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which was rescued. Uh, not totally, but certainly a, quite a dramatic improvement. But then we also noticed that there were other tissues that you wouldn't expect were rescued. One of them, which you probably saw in the picture, is the fur and the skin look better. And that was a little bit unexpected to us because we thought, how on earth do you work your muscles and your skin gets better? But my wife did the pathology here. This is nice, normal skin in the wild-type animals. These are the mitochondrial disease uh, critters showing much uh, reduced uh, dermis. And this is what happens with aging as well. And unfortunately, we had uh, one of our MILAS patients uh, uh, die just two weeks ago. Uh, and she has the 3243 mutation. And I can't use her picture here because I don't have her consent, but her skin was incredibly wrinkled, incredibly thin, at age 45, she looked like an 80 year old. And so certainly we do see this and I, we really have to do some work to publish it, but there's major uh, issues with the skin in a number of our patients. And again, almost totally rescued with the endurance exercise. So why is that relevant? The reason it's relevant is from a drug therapeutic development perspective, if we can figure out what the heck is allowing muscle to contract and then making skin and eyes and hair and fur and ears. How, how are those actually working? And so there's a concept of something called myokines that first came from Benta Peterson's group in Copenhagen, where she described something called interleukin-6 released from muscle, hence the name myokine, and these mediate beneficial effects in other tissues. 
And she's recently shown that the IL-6 pulses are probably involved in the lower rates of cancer seen with people who exercise. And at first she showed that it has a profound effect to improve energy metabolism in the liver. But one of the concepts that we had is, could we use exercising humans and these mice to identify a number of these myokines, which we've termed exerkines because they don't all come from muscle. Some of them go from uh, muscle to liver and then liver re uh, releases it. Some come directly from fat, etc. So we call these things that go up with exercise exerkines, and uh, that's, as you'll see, what we called our company. So we started a company to try and identify what these things are and hopefully bring them to uh, market and test them in patients with mitochondrial disease. So one of the things that we thought is first, is there anything in the serum that actually can help mitochondrial patients? And we needed that proof before we went on and started the company. So uh, we did a whole bunch of experiments, but this is one of many. So what we did is we took serum from somebody at rest and serum from somebody immediately post-exercise. So these are blood samples in the same person at rest and exercise, and we pooled them all together. And what we did is we measured mitochondrial capacity in patients with polymerase gamma mutations. So these are adults with a disease called Sando uh, from polymerase gamma mutations, and they have low oxygen consumption ratio when incubated in resting serum, but it improves dramatically when we incubate in exercise serum. So then we said, okay, taking the stuff you saw with the mice, taking the serum that we have in our patients, can we do a process called proteomics and figure out what proteins are there? And could we then take them and use them like an insulin pen and give them, for example, to patients who are so severe in their mitochondrial disease that they couldn't exercise? And would it work? So one of the ones we found was uh, interleukin-15 I uh, can't see it there because of closed captioning, but uh, I'll show it to you in a minute. So interleukin-15, there we are, uh, is one of the myokines uh, or exerkines that we discovered. And this was published in Aging Cell just a few years ago. Uh, and our patent's working its way through the process. So what we did is we compared mice exercising on the treadmill to mice getting interleukin-15. And we had to very carefully figure out how much interleukin-15 to mimic exercise. So we gave them the pulses and we wanted to see what happened. So we did this for a month. And again, it took us a huge amount of work to figure out how much IL-15 to give them to mimic what happened with exercise. So we mapped that out in the animals. And what we found, this is animals that got salt water injections. These are animals that got the IL-15 injections and these are animals that exercise. So white means very little mitochondria, dark means mitochondria. So you can see that in skin and muscle, there is a stimulation of mitochondrial biogenesis in both of them, just from the IL-15. So this is one exerkine of many that is mediating some of the effects. So what we're trying to do is come up with multiple uh, exerkines uh, to perhaps be even more uh, potent for kids with severe disease uh, as we have many, for example, with severe spasticity, um, severe epilepsy, whatever the movement disorder or disorder might be, who can't exercise, and that's one of our goals. So I think uh, to summarize, uh, certainly in adults and kids, um, and more so in kids, um, uh, for kids we want to make it fun when they exercise, and for them, you don't bring them to a gym and say do three sets of 15 repetitions. For kids, you play. So endurance exercise is going for a hike, and here's an example of a kid doing resistance exercise, and I didn't need consent because that's my daughter um, when she was a little, a little rodent running around. And uh, so again, play for kids is their exercise. For all people with uh, mitochondrial disease, start slowly. Every human being in the world has a different exercise capacity and gradually ramp it up. Listen to your body because if you push a little bit too hard, you can always cross into pathology. And the theory there is just a little bit of a stress recover. A little bit of a stress, recover. And then eventually you can push that stress a little bit higher as your body adapts. But you've got to be careful not to go too hard too fast. We also think it's important to mix up different types of exercise, both endurance and resistance. And again, for many patients, if, for example, your Milas syndrome causes you to be severely weak, go on a bike with almost no resistance and get a little bit of cardio. If your Milas syndrome causes you to have severe exercise intolerance but you have normal strength, 
start off with strength exercise. So play to your strengths and then gradually as you adapt, uh, you will get better. Make sure you warm up, don't just jump right in because it does take a while, especially in mitochondrial disease, to get the blood flowing and to get the adaptation starting to go. And by all means, make sure you don't exercise if you're fasted for too long. Um, so generally three to four hours after a meal is when most people can tolerate it better. And if you feel sick, if you've got a fever or a flu and you just feel absolutely trashed, you know, don't force yourself to go to the gym, take a day off. It's better to you know, uh, lose the, uh, the battle and win the war. Um, and then if you have lots of pain in your muscle, if you worked out on a Monday and your muscles are still achy on a Wednesday, take an extra day off and maybe do something else and use a muscle group that you didn't use because it does take a while for muscles to recover and get better. And then I'll just finish by thanking uh, some of my grad students who did uh, uh, pretty much all the work and the folks in my lab and most importantly Dan Wright and uh, family and his uh, kind uh, trust fund for some of the support for our early work. And um, from a disclosure perspective, as I mentioned, um, I am the um, CEO uh, of this company called Exerkine, where we're trying to come up with therapies for mitochondrial uh, disease. And then a bunch of other uh, groups have funded uh, our basic science research, and of course to the clinic, uh, who really are the face of the clinic, and these are the folks that uh, are there day in, day out uh, with all of our patients. Thank you. Yeah, but again, um, you have to start so low um, and because the goal there really is with time, we know that the muscle actually can repair itself and CKs tend to come down when you train. Uh, so for example, the most uh, severe disorder I can think of with high CKs is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. CKs are chronically in the 20 to 30,000 range and yet those children definitely improve with exercise and their CKs actually get better. But you've got to start incredibly low um, and when you say critical, I mean critical is, hey, go to ICU. I mean, obviously you're not going to train if, it, if it's critically high. But uh, many of the patients in some of our studies have lactase of 7 or 8 chronically, and uh, that improves with training. In fact, we had one young lady who had lactates of 7, 8 every time she came in. And then she started, uh, I mean, it's a slow 5K that she can do, but she gradually got herself up that she could finish a 5K. And uh, her lactates are chronically in the 2 to 3 range now. Um, so it will improve, but you've got to be careful because even an able-bodied person, we have people come in who join this CrossFit stuff and then uh, who've never trained in their life and some idiot tells them to do 300 push-ups and they get rhabdomyolysis. So anybody can cross into that threshold, so you've got to be really, really careful. That's the only question. Yeah, so uh, the point there was that um, for decades, uh, the only CoQ10 formulation was a powder in a gelatin capsule. Um, I won't say the specific company that sold it in Canada, but it was uh, so bad that even our inherited metabolic disease program would only supply that. And uh, some of the initial work by the folks who eventually formed Tishcon uh, showed that the stuff that you buy from Sigma, the standard CoQ10, is incredibly uh, uh, lipophilic and it's almost impossible to dissolve. I mean, we're trying it in our lab and you can't dissolve it at all. So when people were taking it and then they said, ooh, the stuff doesn't work, it's because it all came out in their poop because nothing got absorbed. So then it was pretty clear from animal work that you needed the hydrophilic form or you needed to take the CoQ10 and put it in a liposome, which uh, allows it to get transported into the body. And so uh, many of the CoQ10 formulations out there, um, I think that company in Canada went out of business that was trying to sell the powder, but most of the formulations that you all have uh, have a some sort of either a proprietary liposome or something that allows it to get absorbed. And all I was saying there is that in the early studies it said CoQ10 did nothing. Well, of course it didn't because they didn't measure it in the blood and we now know that it all just came out in their poop. They weren't absorbing it. Uh, but I think most of you now are pretty safe with the co uh, compounds that are out there. They're all um, well absorbed. Well, that's a problem, of course. Then you're kind of uh, up the creek. I mean, so the point there, if you have Menge syndrome, for example, um, we have several patients with that where they have severe GI issues. It's a, it's a real problem because we just don't know how much they're actually absorbing. Uh, and of course, 
the number one side effect from the mitochondrial cocktail, I don't care you know, what cocktail you have, is GI upset. So between five to 10% of our patients uh, taking the cocktail have to discontinue one or all of it because of GI upset. Now ways you can get around it is just like exercise, start off with a quarter of the dose, try that for a month, go to a half the dose, go to three quarters because every human being is different. Number two, take your supplements in the middle of your meal. So don't take it on an empty stomach. I don't care what anybody says, if you do it, you're gonna get tummy upset and it's no better because think about biology. When do we normally get our vitamins and minerals? With food, that's how we evolved, right? So anyone who says you can't absorb it with food doesn't uh, understand normal uh, developmental physiology and biology. And so take it in the middle of food. So I've tried taking creatine and all of these supplements uh, for fun. And if I take them on an empty stomach, I'm sick for three or four hours afterwards. So I'd eat my uh, Cheerios and then I'd suck them all down. I'd keep eating my Cheerios and then I could go for a run after or anything because it's mixing in with your food the way nature, God, whatever you believe in, <laughs> intended it to. Evolutionary biology intended it to come in that way. Yeah. On the brain? Yeah, you mm -hmm. said that in your mice models that, um, that there was, uh, you found that the brain tissue that was shown that you were thinking. Yeah, yeah. Could you elaborate? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I um, can't remember exactly because I'm not a, um, a neuroscientist, um, but there was a study at least 15 years ago published in Nature where they first showed that with exercise you get an increase in neurogenesis, which means making new nerves in a part of the brain called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is very important for laying down new memories. Uh, and there's a thing called the dentate gyrus, and they showed very significant improvements in uh, new nerves that were coming from the stem cells in the dentate gyrus. And there's a couple of other regions. The subventricular zone um, uh, also uh, has uh, stem cells that will grow in response to exercise. So that's been so well documented now. We just finished a lifelong uh, mouse exercise study where 50 uh, mice for two years were randomized to be sedentary in the cage and the other 50 were randomized to uh, exercise every day so they could choose to do whatever they want on a little uh, spinning treadmill. And the mice who exercised had uh, larger brains, they had improvement in stem cells, so they had many more stem cells that were left, left at the end of two years uh, and their neurogenesis in response to an acute exercise bout was much better. Wasn't quite as good as the young guys, but it was much better than the sedentary old guys. So there's no question that brain uh, function improves. In fact, there was a human study uh, with older adults that uh, used these brain games that everyone's uh, advertising. And they did, I think it was two years of brain games versus two years of light uh, aerobic activity. And the increase in the size of the hippocampus was greater in those that did the exercise, or at least the attenuation of the drop because they were already old. Uh, was uh, was much better with exercise than brain games. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to ask this question. I apologize if I have to lingo. Our daughter has a mitochondrial disease that's like ALS, mm -hmm. and she um, is in physical therapy three times a week. Yep. And if she plateaus, and then the insurance company says she don't need physical therapy anymore. And we have to fight with them to get it to be stated. And during those times, she does atrophy. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So my question is this. The medication that you gave the mouse that that couldn't exercise, um, just, and you saw result in the increase in, in the mitochondria, is that a medication for those times when I can't get get her exercising? And um, well, we did in the mouse model there, this one uh, that I showed was only exercise. We didn't do a supplement in these mice, but we have done the mitochondrial cocktail that we gave to our uh, patients, uh, two mice, and we found that their exercise capacity went up even without exercise. So we think that it's a, it's a good adjunct and um, it probably would make sense for people to be on the antioxidant cocktail before you start exercising. And normally we wouldn't do it in an able-bodied person because we want a little bit of oxidative pulse. But the problem with mitochondrial disease is the oxidative stress in cells in most cases is pretty high. So we want to bring it down with the cocktail first and then allow the exercise to have little blips that go transiently upwards. And so I think that would be a good way to start is to be on the cocktail first before you start. Uh, She's on a mask. <laughs> um, it's just frustrating because when the insurance company says no physical therapy, because they don't understand what mitochondria disease is, they're like, oh, she can't. Yeah. And even though she does exercise at home, home program, um, when she goes back to physical therapy, 
Yeah, and, and you're saying exactly what we're doing. Essentially, the way I think about it in a really uh, generic fashion is the mitochondrial cocktail is really icing on the cake compared to exercise, and you're proving exactly what we've been saying, and that is that properly done, supervised, um, or you know, yeah. rigorous phys uh, physical therapy done very appropriately is really the most important stimulus, because then what you're doing is you're relying on natural biology to improve the function of the mitochondria and lower oxidative stress, uh, rather than just taking a supplement. Uh, but the supplement is a nice addition. I always call it the icing on the cake, and we have numerous mouse models where we've done this. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't know who's first. Maybe I think you beat him, and then you're next. And <laughs> well, we know that two months of the cocktail in the humans lowered oxidative stress and lactate. So all, all I can say is that's that you know, so two, months two months we were able in, in humans to prove that it went down. It probably works much faster than that, but that would be a safe thing. Mm -hmm. This kind of goes back to the uh, previous woman's question. IL-15, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, I, I didn't realize you were talking about the IL-15. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, I thought you were talking about an oral supplement. Yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. Is that, do you have plans for a clinical trial? Well, we don't think that that on its own is going to work. Uh, again, it goes back to the ALL issue, uh, treating uh, cancer, and that is um, there's multiple ways in which cancer cells work, and if you only use one thing, I don't think it's the best. Exercise evolved, um, you know, we've been exercising as, uh, as homo sapiens for 150,000 years, and so Mother Nature selected this really complex milieu that causes these benefits. So we're trying to get combinations of three, four, or five of these things to see if we can really come up with something that's beneficial. So we're still screening a number of different combinations right now, uh, but of course, the first thing we will do is do aging mice, polymerase gamma mice, uh, muscular dystrophy mice, and then from there, uh, flip into uh, safety studies and then trials with mitochondrial disease. That would be the goal. But again, I would emphasize don't be hoping for a therapy like that to supplement, or sorry, to, to replace exercise if you can exercise. It's always better to use Mother Nature first. So I think you were first, and then, yeah. Um, how do you find the safe uh, exercise program and training for people that are patients? Yeah, how do you find a safe uh, an exercise program and trainer for mito patients? Um, I think first and foremost you need somebody who's interested and in general we find that the kinesiologists, so these are people that go through a four-year undergraduate degree program in exercise physiology are usually really interested and so they'll go and they'll read my work and Tanya's work and our recommendations and they would be very good to apply that. Often these people are employed as personal trainers but you've got to be careful because if it's a meathead person that just pumps weights it's a whole different kettle of fish. So in Canada, we have a certified kinesiology training program. So you have to go through, do a four-year undergraduate degree, and then you do 600 extra hours training as a kinesiologist before you're allowed to actually counsel patients, which I'm very much in favor of because I think you can do a lot of harm. And for example, my secretary, who knows all about rhabdomyolysis, went with some personal trainer, and they made her do like 400 push-ups. And my secretary, I don't think, has done more than lift her pencil for the last three years. And she went into massive rhabdomyolysis um, as a consequence because of some meathead who told her to do all this crazy stuff. So you've got to be very careful that you don't get uh, the wrong person. Physiotherapists, there's a whole range. Some uh, know how to treat contractures, they do pulmonary therapy, whatever it might be, but they don't really understand exercise because you don't learn exercise physiology in physiotherapy school. But there are some who have the interest and have taken the extra training. Um, so you really have to talk to uh, those individuals. Now we have put out an exercise DVD sponsored through a small grant of, uh, from one of our uh, patients. And so we give that to the kinesiologist or the physiotherapist. They look at it and say, okay, I, I know the general principles, but I'm the person who's going to implement it. And so they can translate that. It's very much like dietary recommendations too. I mean, you know, I can tell you you should eat 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram per day, but I have no clue how to get that in the real world. And that's where dietitians would come in, right? So. Um, uh, what we're doing though, practically, is that uh, our exercise DVD, we keep making more and more and more and we're sending them out, it's costing us a fortune. So we're going to put it on YouTube. So uh, be aware we're doing a new iteration of our exercise DVD with all of these things on it. 
how do you start, what do you have to be careful of for muscular dystrophy and mitochondrial disease. Those are the two big things that we see and treat. And uh, so that'll be on YouTube, hopefully within the next three months. Yeah. So you had a question and then you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lynn? That's a tough one. The question is that we looked at gastrointestinal effects and certainly we know and I know personally being an athlete, I've done races um, and I, some of you will find this kind of crude, but I say to my daughter, you haven't pushed hard enough until you start pooing blood. And the, the point there is if you exercise too hard, you will actually defecate blood. So what happens is if you push too hard, your gut uh, blood supply can drop by 90%. And afterwards, uh, like when I run a race and it's really hot and I'm a bit dehydrated, my ab abdomen hurts, I can't eat for five or six hours. But what happens, we think, is that you eventually adapt to it and then the gut goes through these periods of decreased blood supply and then eventually it will adapt. It's something I would love to do because we have the ability to look at gut permeability and various other things, but I you know, would swear in a stack of Bibles that the gut adapts as well. And it's just so poorly understood. The one thing people have done is that they've looked at the ability to take in uh, carbohydrate fluid during exercise, and if you take that uh, and train for a period of time, the absorptive capacity does go up. So it's likely that the gut does respond favorably. But again, you've got to be careful because if someone had Mengi syndrome and they went on a bike for an hour right out of the, the gate, they'd probably end up uh, with severe uh, bleeding in their gastrointestinal tract. Well, of course, that's what I'm saying is that, uh, yeah, if, if done properly and not pushed too hard, uh, there's absolutely no question uh, that certainly the absorptive cap capacity moves up. And if that's the case, probably the smooth muscle function would improve. I just don't have definite evidence to support that, but I'd be shocked if it didn't. But it, it's a good question because we should do that in some of our next studies. Yeah. Question at the back first. Sorry, uh, this is my hypoacusis uh, or presbycusis from getting too old. Oh yeah, strength exercises with dystonia. That's a good one because with dystonia, sometimes it can be so bad that you actually can't do any strength exercise because your arm is too rigid. Yeah, which is tough. Um, but just thinking, uh, I mean, obviously Botox is the most effective therapy for yeah, I mean, which helps with the dystonia, um, and likely the exercise would be helpful in someone that had Botox, because Botox works by decreasing muscle mass, and that might help you to maintain the muscle mass so you don't shrink too much, but still get the benefits of the Botox in terms of softening up the muscles. But that's a really good question. Um, certainly ataxia, which is a major problem for a number of our patients, we know that improves with exercise training, but Generally, for ataxia, you want to do ataxia-specific exercises, and those are more balanced exercises. And we like that WE program, you know, with the balance board. Yeah, I think that WE program is amazing. Those balance boards used to be twenty thousand uh, bucks. Now, because of mass production, they're two hundred bucks for a, a good WE board. And we have our patients bring in their little WE uh, balance number uh, as they do training, and it's dramatic the improvements that we see. But uh, you know, it's a great question because the basal ganglia. Uh, which is what controls the dystonia, um, uh, do get a lot of aging associated mitochondrial dysfunction. They're very prone in many mitochondrial disorders to, uh, to, uh, to dysfunction. And dystonia is a really big issue. And that area should, and we know it does increase mitochondrial um, enzyme activity in response to exercise. So it should get better over time. But yeah, how do you start if a muscle's so rigid? And yeah, it's a tough one. Okay, a couple more questions. I guess we're way over time. <laughs> Yeah, the question is, uh, with contractures, uh, can you reverse them? I mean, 
contractures are a challenge. Uh, we know that if you don't use it, you get a contracture. So every neuromuscular disorder, the contracture development is proportionate to the weakness. So when we see someone with muscular dystrophy, if they're not using that limb, it'll contract. And that's why, for example, if you've got weakness of dorsiflexion picking up your foot, you will get a contracture and then your ankle will be stuck and then you're up on your toes and then you can't ambulate. So prevention is really important with contractures because once they're severely established, it's really hard to reverse a contracture. And so stretching and warm up before exercise is critically important. And if a contracture is developing, which is a physiotherapist would be in the best position to identify them early, you want to get stretching and doing physical means first because you know everybody takes the easy approach. Oh, throw an AFO on them. But if you look at the kid's foot in an AFO, usually it's still pushing down. The AFO is doing absolutely nothing unless you crank the thing down so hard that the kid's screaming at night because they can't handle the pain. So exercise is really important and doing proper stretches to prevent the contractures. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a lot you can do if you have a severely advanced contracture. You might be able to slow down its progression, but it's hard to reverse. I mean, just an example, personally, I train uh, for the last 35 years, 365 days a year. I've only taken one day off. Uh, well, actually, I took a few days off and I ripped my hamstrings off, but even then I was doing pulleys with my arms. But I ripped all the hamstrings off my right leg, had the, my right leg reconstructed, and since I wasn't pushing that leg forward for two years, my left hip got a contractor. And I've been working on that sucker for 10 years now, and I can't reverse the contracture that I got in my left hip with 10 years of dedicated stretching. So my point there is um, it's not getting worse, but it's not getting any better. Final question, somewhere over here? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's difficult if a child's not verbal. I mean, there's so many other cues that they can give you. Uh, certainly if they're uh, sleeping excessively, you're probably pushing it a bit too hard. But the main thing there, I think, with kids is you've got to make it play. You've got to make it fun. Because if you, you know, go in and there's, you know, a physiotherapist, you take them to some clinic and they're cold and it's not fun and they're saying, okay, I'm going to move your arm, you know, 10 times like this, kid's going to be bored out of their gourd. And that's where I think... I'm not a fan at all of computer games and crap like that, but there are interesting ways with Wii programs and other things that you can kind of make a kid's natural propensity to latch onto these crazy computer games and take advantage of it to trick them into exercising and having a good time when they're doing it. But things like music are important. The other thing too is, uh, unfortunately, all you've got to roll up your sleeves and jump in there too. I mean, you know, I hate swimming. Oh man, I hate swimming so much with a passion. And yet my wife used to throw me into the pool with my six month old and I'd have to do, you know, like all this splashing stuff. Uh, it just drove me to drink. I hated it. And I was freezing my butt off, but you know, you do it because you think it's good for your kids. So y'all know that stuff, but you got to get in there with them and do it because they're going to feel much more comfortable. Like my daughter did karate. I didn't want to do karate, but she wouldn't do it unless I went. But when, once you get them over the hump, then they develop the intrinsic motivation and they enjoy doing it because they feel so good. Oh, I think I'm getting cut off. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks.